Clinical Chemistry and Clinical Evaluation of Proteins. Plasma proteins are the most frequently analyzed of all proteins. There are two main groups of plasma proteins, albumin and the globulins. And the globulins are broken down into four different fractions, the alpha-1, alpha-2, beta, and gamma. The predominant lab tests that are performed on proteins include total protein, albumin, globulins, the albumin, albumin globulin ratio or the AG ratio, and serum protein electrophoresis. This is a table showing some common plasma proteins and their characteristics. So you can review this um, table and just get an overview of many of these proteins. I will be giving some more details of some of the proteins and as the course progresses, we will be talking about more and more of these proteins and their clinical significance to certain organ systems. To begin with albumin, so we have pre-albumin, which is a transport protein for thyroxine and triiodothyronine. So those are the thyroid hormones. They're used clinically to assess nutritional status. And then we have albumin. Albumin is the most predominant plasma protein. So it's 52 to 62% of all plasma proteins are gonna be albumin. It regulates osmotic pressure. So that allows us to retain water in the body and helps regulate fluid balance and it serves as a transport protein. A decrease in albumin is seen in liver failure, malnutrition or malabsorption diseases, nephrotic syndrome, and severe burns, while increased levels typically have no clinical significance. The globulins, like I mentioned, are broken down into several different fractions. So the alpha-1 fraction includes alpha-1 antitrypsin. This is increased in acute phase in pregnancy, and it's decreased um, in neonatal emphysema. Alpha-1 fetoprotein is increased in the amniotic fluid and in the maternal serum of uh, women that are pregnant with babies that have neural tube disorders, such as spinal bifida. It's also a liver cancer marker, and it's decreased in maternal syndrome with um, women that are pregnant with Down syndrome babies. There are several other globulins listed here. And like I mentioned, we may um, talk about these in a little bit more detail as the course progresses. The alpha-2 fraction consists of haptoglobin. And haptoglobin binds free hemoglobin. It's increased in nephrotic syndrome and decreased in transfusion reactions, hemolysis, and liver disease. Ceruloplasmin transports copper. This is increased in pregnancy and decreased in Wilson's disease. And then macroglobulin is another one. The beta fraction includes transferrin, which is a carrier protein for iron. Um, lipoproteins are carrier proteins for lipids. And then several others are listed here. C-reactive protein is typically elevated in um, inflammatory reactions. Complement uh, can be elevated during certain types of infections. So as I mentioned, we'll be going through these in a little bit more detail as the course progresses. In the gamma fraction, we have the immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins come in five different classes, IgM, D, G, E, and A. And immunoglobulins themselves have a typical structure of two heavy chains and two light chains. So if we look at this sample immunoglobulin over here, the heavy chains are the longer chains that are found on the inside, and the light chains are the smaller chains that are found on the outsides. In addition, Inside of this fraction, you may find paraproteins. Paraproteins are polymers, monomers, or fragments of immunoglobulin molecules. And Bentz-Jones proteins are going to be the light chains of amino acids that are found, or sorry, uh, immunoglobulins that are found in urine. In general, immunoglobulins can be elevated in chronic inflammation, cirrhosis or viral hepatitis, collagen diseases, and monoclonal gammopathies, such as multiple myeloma. They're decreased in immunodeficiencies. Other proteins of importance that we can measure are listed here, and some of these we will discuss later on. So measuring total protein. Total protein is most often measured in serum, 6.5 to 8.3 grams per deciliter is uh, pretty common. That's our reference interv interval. 
We can uh, measure this using the Keldahl method, which is not commonly used anymore, but basically proteins are digested and then we measure nitrogen. The Biuret uh, method is pretty common and we do use that one uh, most commonly. Violet color is produced when copper in the Biuret agent reagent binds to peptide bonds and then we can measure the color change. And then there's also dye binding. Albumin has the highest dye binding capacity but we will um, mix the protein with a particular dye. The charged protein binds to the dye and it changes the absorbance of the dye and we can measure that absorbance change. Abnormality is related to total protein. So if we have hypoproteinemia, hypo means less. Proteinemia is talking about a protein disorder. So we have less protein. If total protein levels are less, uh, this can occur in any condition where there's a negative nitrogen balance. So it can be caused by excessive loss of proteins, decreased intake of proteins. So if a person um, is avoiding eating protein or not um, wanting to eat protein, we can see this. Decreased synthesis of protein or an accelerated breakdown of protein. Hyperproteinemia is the opposite. Hyper means more. So we see an increase in total pro uh, plasma proteins. This occurs during dehydration, when, when the concentration of proteins is elevated due to decreased volume of solvent water. It also results from excessive production of proteins, such as gamma globulins. Um, so if we start producing a whole bunch of antibodies, that can cause hyperproteinemia. Sometimes we need to measure specific proteins. So we have different methods for doing so. Salt fractionization uses sodium salt to cause precipitation of globulins, and that leaves behind albumin, and then we can measure albumin. Um, that dye method is a way to measure albumin. So albumin then measured um, by dye binding, it's the most common. The positively charged albumin binds to the anionic dye, and because opposites attract, it's going to bind, and then we can measure um, the change in color. Total globulins can be measured um, by direct calorimet calorimetric method using glyoxylic acid. Albumin can then be calculated by subtracting the globulin from the total protein. And then we also have electrophoresis, which is the separation of proteins on the basis of electric charge densities. The AG ratio. So the AG talks about the albumin to globulin ratio. The reference interval is 1.1 to 2.5. And what we would typically do is get a measure of total protein and a measure of albumin and subtract the two to get the total number of globulins. And when we do that, we are going to just divide the two to get our uh, number. So a low AG ratio means that there's less albumin in the plasma. Could indicate autoimmune, liver, or kidney disease. A high AG ratio means that there's less globulin, which could indicate leukemia or certain genetic disorders. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about serum protein electrophoresis. Proteins are amphoteric, which means that they change their charge based on the pH of the environment that they're in. The isoelectric point the PI is the pH at which the protein has no net charge. Every protein has an isoelectric point and it's a little bit different for each protein. But when we put that protein in that um, isoelectric point or in that particular pH, it's not going to have a charge. It's gonna be an uncharged protein. If the pH is higher than the isoelectric point, the charge of that protein becomes negative. If the pH is lower, than the isoelectric point, the charge of that protein becomes positive. So for protein electrophoresis, an alkaline buffer, so alkaline, we're talking about a base, so it's gonna have a higher pH. It's gonna cause the ionization of the carboxyl groups. So if you remember the um, basic structure of the amino acid, we have the amine group and the carboxyl group, that's COOH. And that's gonna produce a negative charge. So we are putting it in an alkaline buffer. So we're increasing the pH of the environment of that protein that causes that protein to have a negative charge. Then we're gonna apply the samples of that protein to uh, a chamber that's close to the cathode. So I'm just gonna skip ahead to show you what this kind of looks like. So we have an electrophoresis chamber 
We have one side that has the cathode, which has a negative charge. We have another side with an anode that has a positive charge. And this is a pH of 8.6, which means it's alkaline, or it's basic, because it's high. So because it's basic, our protein now has a negative charge. So we're going to load our protein samples into these wells, and these negatively charged proteins are going to be next to the negatively charged cathode. Opposite charges attract. Like charges repel. So if we have a negative charge on this end and we have a negatively charged protein, these are going to want to repel away from each other. They're going to want to move away and migrate away from each other. We have the positive charge over here. So this negatively charged protein that we put here is going to want to migrate through toward the positive charge. And the positive charge is applied to this entire end laterally and equally. So all of these are just going to move directly to the right toward this positive charge side. So again, the support medium is connected to two electrodes and current is passed through the medium to separate the proteins. The speed of the migration depends on the degree of ionization of the protein at the pH of the buffer system. In addition to the size and shape of the protein, the temperature, the electric field strength, and the buffer that was used. So once we apply the charge, the proteins are going to migrate through, and then we're going to get a particular banding pattern for that sample. Once we have that banding pattern, protein fractions are going to be fixed by immersing the support medium in an acid solution, and that's going to denature and immobilize the proteins. And then proteins are going to be abstained, uh, and they're going to appear as bands on the support medium. The membrane is going to be inspected visually or with um, a densitometer. So this is what the densitometer will do. Um, there's a lamp, light goes through the filter, it's going to hit the sample, and then there's a detector which is going to produce a scan image. When we start to look at the densitometer scan, this right here is normal. And you're going to see those fractions that I mentioned earlier are all represented. So we have the albumin fraction, and then we have the globulin fractions. So the alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and gamma. And this is a typical reference pattern that's normal. So this is what we want to see in a normal patient's um, specimen. This is an example of one that's abnormal. So you can see that the albumin is decreased from the total protein percentage, and then you can see this large peak over the gamma. And this is called a monoclonal increase, which typically indicates a monoclonal gammopathy. And one of the common monoclonal gammopathies or um, antibody disorders is going to be multiple myeloma. So looking at a couple more examples here, so here's the reference again, here's that monoclonal um, increase. Here you can see a dip where we're missing that alpha-1 peak. This is an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. In this one, you can see elevated peaks for the alpha-2 and beta. This is nephrotic syndrome. Here, you can see an increase in the peak for the alpha-1, the alpha-2, and the beta, which this can indicate inflammation. And then here you can see um, a broad peak for the um, gamma, and that can indicate cirrhosis. There are additional methods of analysis for proteins. High-resolution protein electrophoresis gives us a little bit more detail on the types of proteins that are within those fractions. So it allows for further separation of proteins into as many as 12 bands. It uses a higher voltage, a cooling system, and it's a more concentrated buffer, which allows for that separation. There's also capillary electrophoresis, which involves the separation of molecules in silica capillaries. There's isoelectric focusing, which is zone electrophoresis that separates the proteins on the basis of their isoelectric point. And then there's immunochemical methods where we use um, antibodies that are specific to recognizing and binding to certain types of proteins, and they're me measured by immunochemical assays. They're generally referred to as immunofixation, and those types of methods will be discussed further in um, the immunology course.
proteins in other body fluids. So urinary protein, um, when plasma proteins appear in urine, it's because they've passed through the renal glomerulus and have not been reabsorbed by the renal tubules. Protein in the urine is not normal. So when we see protein in the urine, that's usually a red flag. Um, if protein's in the urine and a woman is pregnant, that could indicate um, some blood pressure disorders and further tests need to um, kind of look at uh, preeclampsia and other types of things that could be going on. Methods of measurement, qualitative with reagent test strips, um, precipitation, dye binding, immunochemicals, so there's different methods that we've already referred to previously in this lecture. Cerebral spinal fluid proteins, abnormally increased levels occur in conditions in which there is an increased permeability of the cap capillary endothelial barrier through which ultrafiltration occurs. So if we get um, a lot of protein in there, that's, um, that's not good. It could include bacterial, viral, and fungal meningitis, a traumatic tap, multiple sclerosis, an obstruction, a neoplasm, which um, is some type of new growth, disc herniation, and cerebral infarction or um, a blockage. So now that we've learned a little bit about proteins in other body fluids, um, we're just going to kind of evaluate all of the different ways that proteins have uh, relevance to human health. So this concludes the uh, lecture on proteins and amino acids, and uh, next up we'll be talking about enzymes.